in my opinion, this is the darkest day in the history of the United States of America. Our president has allowed to come across our borders millions and millions of people. We have no idea, by and large, who they are, where they are, generally where they came from. We know that much of the world is shouting that Israel is the little Satan and the United States is the big Satan. And I assure you of the millions who have come in, they're undoubtedly terrorists, undoubtedly those who will do harm or seek to do harm, 9-11 like throughout this country. That's a sad, tragic story of a president and his administration who put politics and keeping in power to change the demographics of a country at all costs to the citizenry. That's where we are. There is nothing more frightening than this I have ever observed or seen in my lifetime and I dare say in the history of our land. If you do not know that, you think that is exaggerated, I can tell you it is not, it is accurate, it is factual, and that is the great fear that is slowly sweeping through our land. The situation in Israel is dire. We do not know the results of this. How many of the nuclear atomic powers will get involved in a conflict that in a twinkling of an eye can be totally out of control. In the meantime, we have a president who made a proclamation to be established last Easter Sunday that the group of people who are in my prayers and your prayers who are confused about gender, male, female, dysphoria has set in, and the president sought to have a coming out celebration on Easter Sunday of these who are so broken and confused about their very identity. I have never known a president in history who strikes such a deadly blow to the Christian faith. This is where we are. If there's ever a time to pray, we pray better in crisis of life, do we not? Sick, death, suffering, challenges, family, relationship. We pray better in a crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, if this is not a crisis, we've never seen a crisis. So God's people, what can I do? What can you do? As we get through the teaching today, I hope you'll take a second, a New York minute, and say, how does that apply to where we are? Hope you'll do that. I pray you'll do that. I have done that. Say, that question is, what, what can I do? What can you do in the mess in which we find the world, and especially the United States, when we have leadership that is basically Godless and a million miles from God we know in Jesus Christ. That's where we are. So I wonder if you can kneel where you are. Maybe you can't. 
The orchestra would have a tough time, others would. Let's kneel together and just pray for a moment. Could we do that? Father, so many times we've come before you and not known how to pray exactly. We've come to that time. We pray that thy will might be done. And we pray that you will awaken, beginning with me and with everybody here assembled, you will wake us up to new life, to new hope, to new belief, to new faith, so that somehow we might be, Lord, individually a light in this most darkened moment in history. Lord, you speak now, let me get out of the way, is our prayer for healing, for restoration, for forgiveness, for a new life, for a second chance, made in the powerful name of of our living, resurrected, moving, acting Lord. This same Jesus, we pray to you, dear Father. In his name, amen. Neurocoupling. That's a new word to me. It's what neuroscience has given us in recent days in talking about communication. When I speak a word of facts, statistics to you with details and numbers, that part of my brain fires up and it fires up your part of your brain where you absorb facts and figures and numbers and details. Neurocoupling, bang. This part comes out of my part of the brain. It fires up your part of the brain, and you hear. Also, if I would talk in terms of pictures, stories, that's another part of my brain that is fired up. And another part of your brain hears those pictures and sees those pictures and those stories. It's neurocoupling. Now, when we speak of statistics and numbers and details, we remember those usually for about three days. That's right, about three days. But if we put pictures and graphic stories to it, sometimes we can remember it for Six days, a week, and sometime a lifetime when there's a picture. Jesus, in trying to prepare you and me and the world from his life to today, he used parables, which are stories that call for a response, which are memorable stories, so that when he was gone, those of us who We're waiting until we graduate to be with him. We'll have basic operational principles as to how the kingdom of God operates now and how it'll operate forever. Therefore, in the Bible, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven are interchangeable. So here in these graphic stories, he uses things everybody in that day understood, a seed, a harvest, food, all kinds of things, the stars, the moon. He attached these kingdom principles that are operative so that we might remember them and so that they might remember them. Parables. Parables. Illustration. Member of our staff is named Tom Griffin. Tom's been on our staff Oh, 30 plus years. I remember meeting his mother years ago, and she was the wife of a Methodist pastor. 
And she said that when Griff was a baby, she'd go to some kind of church meeting, and it got long and boring. Maybe you've been to some like that. Say, well, I've been to a sermon like that. Oh, anyway. And she said so she would leave, she'd pinch the baby, and he'd cry, and she'd get out. <laughs> she said any time she went to a church experience, it wasn't meaning. She'd pinch Griff, and he'd cry, and he'd run out. <laughs> Even when he was a little boy, she'd bend down and say, oh, yes, and they would go out. Pretty good secret how to get out of church, isn't it? <laughs> you remember that. I heard that 30-plus years ago. It's memorable. I wish I'd used it with my boys sometime. <laughs> you see, that's what Jesus did. He told stories that have punch and power. They were memorable, for people could understand them, and they could apply them in their life. That's what the parables were. That kept people awake in church, believe it or not. It kept them awake in his assemblies. And so today we look at two little brief parables that carry punch and meaning and significant for us. Take your Bibles. Matthew chapter 13, first book of the New Testament, gentlemen. Jesus says, begin with verse 31. And another parable he put forth to them saying, listen, the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree. So the birds of the air come and nest in his branches. Another parable. He spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, yeast, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. What's he teaching them? What's he teaching us? A mustard seed was the smallest seed they knew anything about. Now, a cypress seed is smaller, but a mustard little black seed, Jesus is saying you take that little seed, and you plant it, you put it in the ground, and normally it grows up to a little herb, a little bush. But here he uses hyperbole. He says, that mustard seed grew up into a tall tree. The birds would come and nest and eat those little black seeds. It became, from that little seed, a tall tree. And then he used the other parable. He said, you take leaven, yeast. He said, you put yeast into three measures. You know how much three measures is? It's over 60 pounds of wheat, 60 pounds of flour. That's a lot of flour, isn't it, ladies? And you put just a little pinch of leaven, yeast, in 60 pounds, and that little yeast goes through that whole flour. It goes on, it penetrates, it goes everywhere. Just like that little mustard seed becomes a big tree, that little yeast goes through 50 pounds of flour and just blows it up and puffs it up to about 60 plus loaves of bread. What's he teaching us? One plain important principle all of us need to get. Little is much when God is in it. Help me. Little is much when God is. It really is. On the 100th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's death, a cartoonist put in the major newspapers of America a cartoon depicting two backwoodsmen in Kentucky talking, and one of them says, anything happening around here? Nah, nothing ever happens in the backwoods of Kentucky. He said, well, Tom Lincoln had another boy, but nothing really happens in Port around here. He was the birth, perhaps the greatest president America's ever known. Nothing ever happens around here. Little as much when God is. And imagine in Bethlehem, these two guys are talking, and they say, well, 
Well, what's going on in town? Eh, you know, this little old creepy town, nothing ever happens. Well, I did hear about this Mary, a woman from out of town, had a baby in the stable last night. Nothing big happens in Bethlehem. You see, little is much when God is small beginnings. You know where all this music comes from right here? You know where it comes from? Eight notes, one octave. That's all they've got. Eight notes. All symphony, all music comes from only eight notes. Puny. Little eight little notes. We get all this. Yeah, yeah. Everything's ever been written. Everything's ever been sung. Eight notes. How many letters in the alphabet? 26. 26 letters of all that's been written and said and explained. Just 26 little. Man, that's, that's nothing, isn't it? But you see, little is much when God is in it. When God is in it. God works through little things. In this moment in history, guess what? God can work through you. Yeah, one person. And God can work through you. And God can work through, oh yeah, you. He can work through one person and do fabulous things. Look in the book of Romans, chapter number 5, verse 18. And therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to everybody, that was Adam's sin, resulting in condemnation. Even though one man's righteous act, the free gift, came to all men resulting in justification of life. That's Jesus. One man, sin, we inherited all that. Jesus, one man, all that forgiven. Verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, that's Adam, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. That's what Christ does for just one person, one man, one woman, awakening in a moment of history, using the light that they have, the influence that they have. One man, one woman, one individual, one teenager. How many times I've seen a group of teens who were vulgar and rowdy, and one teen comes to Christ, and that one teen just begins to change the whole conversation of that group of friends. I've seen it happen many times. I've seen it happen in relationships and families, and just one light turns on, one truth to God. You see, little is much when God is in it. That's the point here. Look at the Bible. David. Well, you think of King David. All No, no. Think of little David. He was a nobody in the backwoods of nowhere, keeping sheep, the runt of the family. Man, he was nothing. But suddenly when Goliath stood up and he was having to take some food to his big brave brothers who were not even fighting, and Goliath stood there, and David looked at him and said, you know, I've, I've killed a bear. It looks tougher than that. And one time I killed a lot. You see, all in God's army there, they had a lot of rock slingers. Yeah, they had a lot of rock slingers. But David had enough faith. He got up and says, hey, I think I can take him. Change the whole history. You see, through one person, David, what about Gideon? Read the story of Gideon. I mean, Gideon was from the Midianites, the back sheep tribe of Israel. He was from the most insignificant family of the Midianites. He was the most insignificant person among the Midianites. His job was pinching the fruit on sycamore trees, whatever that is. That was his job. That's all he'd ever done. But God spoke to him and said, wake up, Gideon. I want you to lead my people against the enemies before me. He just said, Lord, who am I? I mean, I'm nothing. I'm at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. But God says, I'm going to be with you. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, when God is with you and God's with me, it doesn't matter what the barrier, what the obstacle is, we're in the majority. We got the power. <laughs> if God is for us, who can be against us? The answer is nobody. Look what he did with Gideon. He didn't call the people to go and fight the Midianites. 32,000 came. 
And Gideon said, man, this is not much, but I'll be the general of the army. But God started paring down and say, Gideon, you got too many, you got too many, you tell me many. He ended up with 300. And now he was a sergeant, from a general to a sergeant to fight a mighty army. But my goodness, how God used Gideon. You see, little is much when God is. Go to the New Testament. Peter, a fisherman, bombastic, bully, loud spoken. Probably everybody thought he wasn't too bright. Man, he failed the Lord. He boasted. He lied. He deceived. He cursed that he even knew him. My goodness, God took Peter and turned him right side up. He became a mighty spokesman for the Lord. Who would ever have dreamed that? That, that can't be, but it was. The apostle Paul, brilliant. He had figured it out. The baptism was a hallucination. It wasn't real. He attacked Christians. He persecuted Christians, led to Christians being killed. The man, the Lord, appeared to him, and he saw Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden, he became the most powerful missionary that we've ever seen. He took the good news of Jesus Christ all the way into pagan Europe. You see, one man, little is much when God is in it. We have to understand that I'm just one person. You're just one person. I give out so much light. You give out so much light. We use the opportunity we have, and God takes what? What we have and uses it faithfully. By the way, the opposite of that is true. Little is much when God is in it. Much is little when God is not. Oh, I know a lot of people have got much. Got much. But God's not in it. All the way through history, a lot of people had much, but God was not in it. I think of O.J. Simpson. Man, there's hardly been a better athlete, track, football, Heisman, pro, money, acting, fame, popular, announcer. Man, what a tremendous guy, but God was not in it, and he was not in God. See the most dramatic illustration of that? Elvis Presley. Listen, Elvis starred in 33 successful films, made history with his television appearances and specials, globally sold over a billion records more than any other artist, his American sales earned him gold, platinum, multi-platinum awards, 131 different albums and singles, far more than any other artists. 14 Grammy nominations, three wins from the National Recording Arts and Sciences, Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award received the age of 36, named one of the 10 outstanding young men in the nation of 1970. When Elvis first started, he had one hit song, and a reporter went to him and said, Elvis, what are your goals in life? He said, I want to be rich, I want to be famous, I want to be happy. Uh, just a few weeks before he died, another reporter interviewed Elvis, and they said, Elvis, I remember what you said at the beginning of your public life. Your goal was to be rich and famous and happy. He said, obviously, you're rich. He said, without a doubt, you're famous. He said, Elvis, are you happy? He dropped his head and almost tearful. He said, I'm lonely as hell. I don't think he knew that he was giving a good definition of hell, which is eternal loneliness. You see, much is little when God is not. He had sung some of the finest gospel songs. I listen to them today. You'll ever hear. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. 
with eyes wide open, he'll forgive you. He sung great gospel songs. He knew the gospel. He was brought up in the church. But gradually, one way or another, he moved farther and farther away. And the end of his life, his song was, I did it my way, my way. Much is little when God is not in it. So we need to ask the question. This is a very serious question for everybody here, even the orchestra, those that are awake. <laughs> it's a good question to ask yourself. Am I in it? Right. I'm in it. How do you get in it to know that you're in God's family? No, you're with it. You're seeking to live. How do you know you're in it? How do you get there? You get there by faith. Boy, there's a squirrely word, isn't it? Go around and ask people what faith is. Well, faith is believing something you think may not be true. Or faith is believing something you want to be true. Or faith is just what I try to have, but I don't have enough of it. How squirrely and ignorant are those definitions of faith? The Bible, ladies and gentlemen, tells you and me exactly what faith is. Open your Bibles. Hebrews chapter number 11. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Let me ask you a question. Does substance sound like something that you can't feel? No, substance is real, right? Here is substance. All right, here is evidence. And faith is substance and evidence. Is that solid enough for everybody? Remember we talked about that Christianity is not idealism, it's realism. Faith is substance and it's evidence. How do we get that substance and evidence that the writer of Hebrews is talking about? Heliotropism. I don't even know what that word means. I didn't know a week ago. Heliotropism. Heliotropism is what a sunflower has. A sunflower, when it is planted in a little seed, comes up, and it faces the sun in the east when it's coming up, and he follows the sun all day long, and the sunflower faces the sun in the west. That's how the sunflower grows. And that's what that is. That's what we do. When we learn to wake up and receive Christ in our life by faith, what is substance and realism and evidence, then we learn how to face Jesus north, south, east, and west in our life, and all of a sudden, that faith puts Jesus Christ in your life and puts Jesus Christ in my life. You said, well, that is substance, that is evidence, absolutely. Faith is like one of our senses. It's like a sixth sense. Has anybody seen any light waves this morning? Light waves? No, no. But light waves we do not see, but they are there, and our eyes enable us to focus on things. I know that's a chair because my eye picks up those light waves that nobody can see. But they're there, right? That's the only way we see. What about sound waves? Anybody seen any sound waves today? But they're there because we hear and our ear picks up those sound waves we don't see. Do you say light waves are not real because we don't see them? Sound waves are not real because, no, no, no. We know they're real. Evidence, substance is there. That's true of all of our senses. Faith is a sixth sense that enables us to see that which cannot be seen, but it is as real 
as real as sound waves or light waves or everything else that our senses introduce us to. So we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is in us. His Holy Spirit is in us. And that is reality. And that is substance. It is substantial. And we know it. Faith. Faith. Oh, we say faith is real. And therefore, we know that if God is for us, who can be against us? And we know very clearly the basic fact that little things are much when God is in it. And we are in it by faith. And that faith is real because in this earth, we can see all the way to heaven. That is what we learn. That is what we understand. So therefore, we see this ability of the sunflower to just follow the Lord Jesus Christ as you and I track him. In the morning, I see his face. In the evening, his form I trace. In the darkness, his voice I know. I see, you see Jesus everywhere we go. And he is that true north. As we hide his word in our heart that I might not sin against God, we hide that word in our heart. Therefore, we make any decision, any choices, guess what? We run that decision, that choice through the grid of our hearts and our lives because the Holy Spirit is there. We've received Jesus Christ by faith, and that faith gives us substance and gives us assurance and gives us confident knowledge that we have it, <laughs> it. And that's the glory of the Christian life. Our Heavenly Father, how thrilled we are to know because you've given us this experience. We know that Christ is substance and Christ is evidence and the Holy Spirit nails us down in our lives so that the unseen world of heaven moves into the seen world in which we now live for a little while. And we're confident, Father, if you're for us, nobody can be against us. And we learn through experience that if we have the faith just of a mustard seed, we're going to have plenty of faith to take us all the way to victory. Some here need to come to Christ today and say, I want to put my faith out. I want him to come in my life. I want reality. Others here are Christians. They need a church where they can worship and serve. May they say, this is the place I'd like to be. Use this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name.